there, there are two verses in the book of Deuteronomy about the Sabbath that are critical and every person needs to know those two verses. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 13, He declared to you His covenant, even ten commandments. You, you, cannot, you cannot, how can you make it any plainer that, the, that the, the covenant included those ten commandments? In fact, they are, they, they, they represent in that verse the totality of it. He declared unto you His covenant even ten commandments. Uh, that's, 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 not, that's not an interpretation. That's what that verse says. So I, if I just come to the Bible with no preconceived idea of where I want to arrive, I will arrive at the conclusion, He declared unto you His covenant, even ten commandments. Now put with that Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 2 and 3, that said, The Lord our God made a covenant without with us at Horeb, and He did not make this covenant with our fathers. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 2 and 3. He did not, he, at Horeb, Mount Sinai, He declared unto you His covenant, and He did not make this covenant with our fathers. Now what does that mean? Well, what does it say? The God of heaven is trying to tell us something in, in, the, in these two verses, and bear in mind that chapter divisions were put in there by man, and so it's one continuous thought. He declared unto you His covenant, and he, even Ten Commandments, and He did not make this covenant with our fathers. But the problem is that individuals have uh, arrived at a, a, have an agenda that, uh, that the Ten Commandments are still binding. And if you ask most denominational folks, do we live under, should we keep the Ten Commandments? They'd say yes. Prevalent held idea in, in, uh, in the religious world. You, you talk to your Methodist friend, Presbyterian friend, Baptist friends. Uh, do we live under the Ten Commandments? The answer is yes. Now, if you file that in your head and if you buy into that, then you'll be able to understand, you'll be able to understand why the Adventists have the power that they do. If, 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 if I'm studying with an Adventist and I know that, that uh, or my, my preconceived belief is we must keep, keep the Ten Commandments, then the only question to be determined is, what is the Sabbath? And the Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. And, uh, and, and I used to wonder how, why the Adventists had the power that they did because of their history and the beginning of their history. They're called Adventists because William Miller decided in 1843 the Lord was going to come back next year. Um, don't know if you noticed, but he didn't come back in 44. People got on, in white robes, bed sheets, and went up to the mountaintops believing with all their heart that Jesus was going to come back. And he said, oh, uh, he didn't come back. And he said, I missed it by a year. Therefore, uh, he's going to be next year. In 1845, not quite as many people, but they went out again and were awaiting the arrival of Jesus. Now Miller said, I forgot about the year zero. And, and so that's how you add in an, another year. Well, uh, he fell by the way and Ellen G. White came and, and took over that movement and uh, told everybody that she went to heaven. And when she got to heaven, she saw the Ten Commandments there and there was a halo around one of the Ten Commandments. I mean, saw the tables of stones, and they were there, and, and there was a halo around the, the, uh, the Fourth Commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, to substantiate that, you ha they have to, and those who believe that the Sabbath, that we ought to worship on Saturday, they're, they're, you know, there are some other Seventh-day people on this earth, to substantiate that, they've got to separate the Sabbath from Judaism. And they do it two ways. One, they go to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 3 that says that, it, that they say it says, and, and notice how I preface that, that they say it says 
that on the seventh day, while God was resting, he sanctified the seventh day. And it has been sanctified forever and ever, and it, it will be binding upon Abraham and upon Noah and upon Adam and on Enoch and on uh, Isaac and on Jacob and on the Jews down in the land of Egypt. God set up the Sabbath, and the Sabbath was to be binding forever and ever and ever for all mankind. Now that's a misunderstanding of what Genesis 2 and verse 3 says. Uh, the, the other aspect of this is that the Adventists are better at this than anyone else. They talk about a moral law and a ceremonial law. The ceremonial law has to do with the animal sacrifices. It has to do with the fact that uh, uh, every seventh year you did not plant your crop. It had to do with every seven seventh year, or, uh, every every fifty years, seven times seven plus one would be a year of jubilee when all debts would be. For, that's ceremonial, and then all of the animal sacrifices are ceremonial. And, and I find that remarkable in and of itself because how on earth can a sin offering and a trespass offering be described as a ceremony? I mean, it, that, that, it, it does, not, does not forgiveness of sin have something to do far greater than just some ceremony? And does not that have to do with my morality and my relationship to God? And, and so they, they divide they divide that, and so the conclusion they arrive at is that in Genesis chapter 2, on the seventh day, that the Lord sanctified that day, and He revealed it to Adam and to Noah and to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's why Deuteronomy chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 2 and 3 is so important. God did not make this covenant, even Ten Commandments, Chapter 4, verse 13, God did not make this covenant with the fathers. Well, what do you do about Genesis chapter 2? Well, Genesis chapter 2 is written by Moses. And so Moses, after the Sabbath has already been given, looks back all the way two and a half thousand years prior to that time and said, God rested on the Sabbath day and that God sanctified the Sabbath. And that is past tense. Because Moses is writing about something that has already occurred. They've already been to Mount Sinai. And God has now revealed this covenant and made this covenant. And so if, if, you'll, put, if you'll put that in its time frame. The other aspect of this is the fact that God, that the resting was completed before God before God blessed the seventh day. The, King, the old King James says, He blessed the Sabbath day because on that day He had rested. Resting was completed before He sanctified it. And so that means at least, you know, right at the end of the seventh day or beginning of the eighth day or sometime after that, God sanctified that day. Well, he did not sanctify it with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He did not make this covenant, even Ten Commandments, with the fathers. And, and I hope you understand the force of that. And the parallel to that, that kind of language, is Matthew writing about Judas. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus sends out the apostles on a limited commission. And uh, as you look at the list of that, I believe it's down in verse 6 where Judas is mentioned. Matthew chapter 10 verse 6 says, when it lists Judas' name, it says, Judas betrayed him. Past tense. Now if I'm reading that chronologically, and I think because I'm reading it chronologically, that, that, prior, that somewhere in the first nine chapters of the, of the book of Matthew, Judas betrayed it. That's not the case at all. Matthew writes about two events. And looking backwards from his viewpoint where he's writing, two things had happened. You know, he, he selected Judas and Judas, had, Judas betrayed him. And Matthew, looking backwards, said that. Verse 4 it is. <coughs> so so you've, got a, 
You've got, you've got to sort of fit that in, 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 into your head in, in the tenses. Just like Moses looks back and said, God rested and God blessed. Matthew looks back and said, said God sele- or Jesus selected Judas, sent out Judas, and Judas betrayed him. And it's from the, you know, he could not write. When Matthew writes that, could not write and say, well, Judas will betray him. You cannot write it that way. Why? It's already, it's a past tense event. And when Moses writes, God in, inspires Moses to write to use the past tense whenever he says God, he, he rested and he, and he sanctified it. And there are so many other verses. We, we looked at a lot of those other verses. And I don't, I don't want to waste too much time there because I want us to, uh, to be able to have an appreciation of these things. There, they look at Ephesians chapter 2. And then we'll get to, to the book of Romans. But Ephesians chapter 2 talks about the fact that Jews and Gentiles were separated one from the other. What was that middle wall of partition that separated the Jews and the Gentiles? I mean, when, did, when, when does that happen? Abraham, though he's the father of the Jewish nation, in, in, in the sense that we normally use the word Jew, he was not a Jew, nor was Isaac, nor was Jacob. I mean, that distinction had not yet come about. I'm not saying that, they, that uh, they're not uh, the fathers of the Jewish nation, but the concepts of Jew and Gentile does not occur until you get to Mount Sinai. And so there at Mount Sinai, God selects the Jews uh, the Bible says he, let, he flew them out of Egypt on eagles' wings. Is that, isn't that poetic and graphic? Here's good, the Almighty God as a swooping eagle comes down and takes that nation and puts it on his wings and flies them out of the land of Egypt across the Red Sea. Didn't do that to the Gentiles. And, uh, and the, one of the minor prophets said, You only have I chosen of all the nations on this earth. What did he choose them? Well, he chose them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Well, where did that leave the Gentiles? Well, look in verse 11, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 11, that, at, that you, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, and then there's a dash. I'm not sure what, per, what punctuation you have there. It's a parenthetical expression. You, you once in the flesh were Gentiles. You were called uncircumcision by those that are called circumcision made in the flesh by hands. You were called uncircumcised, a term of contempt. Uh, when Peter went and preached to uh, uh, Cornelius, he gets back to Jerusalem and they said, you ate not with the Gentiles, you ate with the uncircumcised. It's, it's not the N word, but it has the intonation of one nation being far greater than the other. And so he says that you were called uncircumcised, which means uncle- which, which is a term of content indicating that they're, they're so far removed from God, there's no hope. Now verse 12 says, at that time you were without Christ, the promise of the coming of the, of the of Messiah, how many prophecies are there about the coming of Jesus? Every one of them made to the Jews in, in a, by, by Jewish writers in, in a Jewish context. context. And, and so he says, you were without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You know, we don't appreciate that expression, commonwealth. At least some of us do not. We have some British folks here. And the sun never sets where? On the British Empire. You know, I have known, I've known a few Brits that were rather uppity. You understand what I'm talking about? I've known a lot of Southerners that same way too. I just want you to know. Of course, Southerners are justified. But anyway, (laughs) anyway, he says, you were not a part of the commonwealth of Israel. Think of the word common, sharing in the wealth. The commonwealth of Israel. Think about the commonwealth of the British Empire. I mean, used to be, I mean it, it, it was, you know, the sun never sets on the British. There's the commonwealth. 
And at that time, you Gentiles were not a part of the wealth that was common among Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, you Gentiles now, were, who were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now look to the next two verses. He himself is our peace. He has made both one. Both what? Both Jew and Gentile. He's made Jew and Gentile one and has broken down a middle wall of separation. A partition that separated Jew and Gentile and he broke that down, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. What is the enmity? In this context, what is the enmity? Was there enmity between Jew and Gentile and Gentile and Jew? Yep, that's not what he's discussing here. He has broken down the enmity that is, God tell me what the enmity is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Here's that old law. Who kept the Sabbath? Jews. Who kept the, who kept the, uh, the Day of Atonement? The Jews. Who kept the sin offering and the trespass offering and all of the offerings of the Old Testament? The Jews. Who kept the food laws? The Jews. Who kept the marriage laws? Who kept, just go on and on and on, a, a, a law of commandments filled with ordinances so as to create in himself, in Christ, one new man from the two, the two what? The two nations, the Jew and the Gentiles. So Jesus came, took away that which separated the Jew from the Gentile, and in his flesh he abolished the enmity the law. He abolished the law in himself and made peace. Then he says, and that he might reconcile both, Jew and Gentile, right next, reconcile them both to God in one body. What's the body? It's the church. Ephesians 1, and 23 says that uh, God put all things under the feet of Jesus and gave him to be head over all things to the church which is his body. And so he abolished in his flesh, the, uh, uh, he reconciled both to God in one, in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. What's the enmity? The law of commandments contained in ordinances. That's, that's pretty easy to understand. Once you walk through and look at the words there and how the Lord uses those words, that's pretty obvious what is being discussed here. And He did it at the cross. That's why Colossians 2.14 says, He nailed the cross to the law, or nailed the law to the cross. That's what He did. Judaism started at Mount Sinai, and Jesus kept the Sabbath. He had to. wouldn't have been sinless if He had not. By the way, He was involved in animal sacrifices. They took Jesus, baby Jesus, and they offered uh, sacrifices, uh, you know, uh, uh, there in connection with the birth of the baby of Jesus. Jesus kept the Day of Atonement. Jesus kept all of Judaism. Jesus kept the food laws. He kept every law there was. He honored the high priest. Oh, Jesus lived under the Old Testament. And so for the Adventists to come along and say, well, Jesus, Jesus kept the Sabbath. Of course He did. If He had not, He would have sinned. And if He'd, if he'd sinned, He couldn't have been our Savior. And so He nailed that law to the cross. Ah. Uh, I want us to get to what I think is the most powerful verse. And 
Some of you have come in and uh, didn't, weren't here when I started the class. I've asked, though your indulgence is, for me to finish up the study of the Sabbath before we start the Minor Prophets in our, in our next study. Because I didn't get, as I described it, I didn't get to the dessert. <laughs> the dessert of all of this, the most powerful verse in all of the Bible about the old law is Romans chapter 7. Because it, 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 it shows two things. First of all, it forever decimates the concept of there being a moral law and a ceremonial law. Romans chapter 7, Paul says, Or do you not know, brethren, that I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. I think you understand that. Uh, when you die, you don't have to pay income tax. Why? You're dead. When you die, if the hearse speeds, you're not in any trouble. <laughs> you know, if the guy is smoking marijuana, driving the hearse, you're home free. There's not one law on the books about any that forbids any dead person from speeding or from smoking marijuana. And you can, you can carry that any extreme that you want to. We understand that. As long as a man lives, he's under the law. Then he says, here's an illustration of what I'm talking about. The woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her, her, her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she's a widow. She's no longer, she's no longer, she's released from the law of her husband. Every time you fill out any sort of application, Name, address, marital status, single, married, widowed. And that's, that, that, that's understood. It, it's so, so much understood. When I, when I was in India, uh, the poor people in India, uh, well, let me say this. In India, the women do not wear wedding rings. The way you can tell if a, if, a, if a woman in India, at least the way it used to be, is married or not, she had a gold necklace around her neck. The poor people that we were working with couldn't afford gold. And they, 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 their marriage ring around their neck was it reminded me of a Venetian blind cord, piece of twine. And they would, would put that around her neck to indicate that she was a married woman. Now when her husband was being cremated, uh, cremations are, are interesting. The, uh, Gary, you might like this. This Gary over here, the son gets to light the fire that his dad is laying on, okay? <laughs> so the next time we sing light the fire, I want you to know what I'll be thinking of, okay? <laughs> but, but, but the, the, you know, there's a, wooden, there's a wood pile and he's laid out on top and there's a very ritualistic kind of thing that they do. And as a part of that, the family marches around uh, the, 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 where the fire's going to be. And then the sun sets the fire. And then what I consider one of the cruelest things I can begin to imagine, while that fire is burning, somebody goes over and cuts off the necklace of that woman, throws it into the fire. I'm sure it fits their culture. It just doesn't fit mine. Can you imagine as a part of a funeral in America, 
you know, right before we close the casket for the last time, go and forcibly take off the wedding ring, the engagement ring, and throw that into the coffin. That, 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 that's, that's hard to imagine. But I say that to emphasize what's here. That she's bound by the law to her husband as long as her husband lives. But if her husband's dead, she's not bound anymore. So then, she marries another man, she shall be called an adulteress. Adulteress is sexual immorality by two people, at least one of whom is married, but not to the person he's having sex with, or she's having sex with. That's what it by definition is. And so the law of the land said, well, you know, you're married, you got a marriage license. No, you know, don't think you quite do that because you're still a married woman. John the Baptist said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother Philip's wife. Whose wife is she? Your brother Philip's wife for she had, for he had married her. Here's a married person that is not lawful for you to have because that woman you're married to is, is married to, to, your, to uh, your brother Philip. Not lawful. And, and so we understand that just by definition. But if her husband dies... She's free from that law, so she's no adulteress, so she's married to another. Now watch the next verse. Therefore, anytime you see the word therefore in the Bible, you need to ask the question. And that question is, what's it there for? You know, <laughs> your kids waited till you dropped the therefores. I told you to do this, and you didn't do it. I told you a second time to do it, and you didn't do it. And I told you the third time, and you didn't do it. And your, your kid is sitting there waiting for the therefores. And so he set out the, the, uh, the, the, the truths that everybody understands. Therefore, my brethren, you have become dead to the law that you might be married through, through the law through the body of Christ the dead that we who was married to the law those under the law did not God describe himself as being married to Israel again and again and was not their, their involvement in idolatry is spiritual adultery, fornication, over and over again. Um, Jeremiah 31. 31, the days are coming. Je Jeremiah speaking 600 B.C. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. The days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. What covenant is that? Deuteronomy 4.13, He declared unto you His covenant, even ten commandments. I'm going to make a new covenant, and it will not be according to the covenant of the ten commandments, which I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, though I was a... Husband to them. God saw himself married to Israel. Now it's that same relationship that is discussed here. The marriage here is not between the Jews and God. But the, the, the argument here, they were married to the law. And he says, you have become dead to the law by the body of Jesus that you might be married to Christ. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Is that powerful? 
if I'm married to the old covenant and to the new covenant at the same time. This passage says, I'm committing adultery. That's remarkable. And so here's God's relationship to Israel in the Old Testament. And the imagery that is used in Romans chapter 7 is, they were married to the law and you have become dead to the law. That's powerful. You are as dead to the law as that woman whose husband has passed away as she is dead to the law of her husband. Does not exist. And you have become dead to the law by the body of Christ. That's why he nailed it to the cross. And so by the body of Christ, something happened and those who were under the law became widows at that time that they might be married to Christ. It is impossible for me to be married to the Old Testament and married to the New Testament without being involved in spiritual adultery. Is this powerful? Isn't this remarkable? Now, isn't, it, isn't, it, isn't it remarkable that the church is called the bride of Christ? Ephesians 5 is a passage that illustrates, says, Husband, love your wife, says, Christ loved the church. For the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is the Savior of the body. And when you get to the latter part of Ephesians 5, it said, Now, won't you understand, I'm not talking about husbands and wives primarily. I'm talking about Christ and the church. Now, I'm married to Christ. The church of Christ is the bride of Christ. It is married to Christ. And for me to go and say, I want to be married to an, to an Old Testament. Now, you look at the far-reaching impact of all of this. You think about how it impacts those like the Mormons who find justification for, for, for polygamy in that old law. Isn't that remarkable? You know, uh, the burning of incense prevalent in, the, in the Roman Catholic and British Catholic Anglicans. Prevalent in their religion. Where's your, where's your authority for that? Well, it's all over here. Yeah, it's all over there. It's not over here. It's over there, if that makes sense. But for me to go back there and seek justification for, for it. Now, if we, if we understand that, by the way, that helps us to understand that the worship in the Old Testament, where, where they were commanded to use instruments of music. If we're, going, if we're allowed to use instruments of music, it needs to be found in this new covenant. And so if somebody go back to that old time, well, they did, they, they did in the old, they did, they offered animal sacrifices, they did tons of stuff. Guess what also they did on, on, in the Old Testament? They kept the Sabbath. And, and I, I just sometimes stand amazed when, when I've talked with those who believe in the Sabbath, they speak more of the Sabbath than they do of the blood of Jesus. Isn't that remarkable? When Moses came off the mountain, he had not all of the Old Testament Bible, but he, for sure he had the Ten Commandment Bible. And you know what he did? He took the blood of animals and sanctified the blood of animals and sanctified the Ten Commandments. The Lord's Supper, this is the blood of the new covenant. For me to go back and to, and to take the Old Testament and, and, and is, is to magnify the blood of animals, perhaps even above the blood of Jesus. But we're not through here. The verse says, you have become dead to the law. Verse 5 for when we were in the flesh, under Judaism, circumcision, things that are involved in that, <laughs> sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law. 
We're dead to the law. We're delivered from the law. And I want you to hear those two, and then we'll get back to how, how the law uh, incre- uh, uh, increases sin, okay? What's my relationship to the law? I'm dead to that law, and there's no way I can be married to the law and married to Jesus at the same time. Cannot do it. And so the Lord took it out of the way. That's a Bible expression in the book of Hebrews to describe that Old Testament. He took it out of the way. That's Paul's expression in, the, in, the, in must be Colossians. He took it out of the way. And so I'm delivered from it. Having died to what we were held by, by that law, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Oldness of the letter is the very thing the Pharisees did. They looked at that and they never wrote the Word of God on their heart. They wrote it in, in, the, in their head. And so they had a religion that was absolutely external in every aspect. Now, watch out. He's going to define what law we're delivered from. He's going to define what law we're dead to. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? You see, the law aroused sinful passion. Mom has just made the best cookies on earth. And the kids almost have forgotten about the cookies being in the cookie jar. But before she leaves to go down to public, she said, And while I'm gone, don't any of you get those cookies. Whoa, she's leaving. (laughs) I bet she didn't count. (laughs) I bet, you know, the presence of the law calls attention to, to that very act. It does it. You see it in children but you'll see it in us too, if you'll just stop and then think about it. Now then, is the law sin? God forbid. Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law said, Thou shall not covet. Which law said thou shalt not covet? The Ten Commandments. You want a a passage that does away with the moral law and ceremonial law? Adventists want to come to this verse. Every time they read a verse about the law passing away, oh, that's animal sacrifice. That's the ceremonial law. In this very passage, I'm dead to that law. I cannot be married to that law. And I'm delivered from that law Which law, Paul, are you talking about? I'm talking about the law that said, Thou shall not covet. Now then, somebody said, Can I covet? Can I commit adultery? Can I bear false witness? No. Why? Not because God told the Jews they couldn't do it, but because He told all mankind in the New Testament, You cannot do it. And I just think it's it's critically important as we think about any time somebody goes back to the Old Testament to try to find justification for New Testament action, they're going back to a law that it, to which we are dead, that we're delivered from, and that we cannot submit to like we're bound to that law. That law is dead. And I'm not under that law in any form. Let me say it one other time, then you can ring the bell if you want to. Nothing was brought over. Nothing was brought over in the New Testament. Brand new. When Jesus finished His preaching in the Sermon on the Mount, He didn't talk about the law like the scribes and the Pharisees. He spake as one who had authority. And the reason it's wrong to have any God before Jehovah God is not because the Jews told people in the Old Testament to do it, but because God says to me, Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Where's that? Oh, it's in the Old Testament, but Jesus says it's in the New Testament too. One brought over, brand new law. 
And, and just because, just because that husband, second husband, looks like your first one, he's not brought over. <laughs> he may have some similarities, but he's not brought over. A widow in the church said to a, a visiting man, you look like my third husband. And she says to him, or he says to her, how many times have you been married? And she says, twice. <laughs> Enjoyed this study, and thank you for bearing with me. I just felt like Romans 7 is so powerful, we had to take time to put that here. Go ahead and ring that bell if you like. It's been...